So here we are with Dr. David Skinner. Welcome. Uh, he is a reader in sociology at Anglian Ruskin University. And David has researched and published widely uh, in the field of social studies of science and technology. So welcome. And today we're going to talk about your PhD research in home computing. Could you tell me when uh, you started your PhD, when you finished your PhD, and why you chose that topic? Okay, well, I uh, began my PhD in 1984. And uh, I'm slightly embarrassed to say I finished it in 1992, but that's another story. Uh, but the, uh, the bulk of the work on the PhD, the empirical work that I did on the PhD, was done in 1986 and 1987. Uh, and I was interested at that time, particularly at the time when I was coming up with the idea for the PhD, Britain was going through... Um, what came to be known as the home computer boom, and I was really intrigued. Having, having worked a little in the computer industry myself, I was really intrigued as to what was going on. I couldn't quite understand why so many people had decided that they really needed a home computer. Okay, so you were right there at the start. So uh, did you have a lot to research at that time? Because that was at the start of the... Uh, I wouldn't say I was actually in at the start because I think um, I began thinking and studying this in the middle of the 80s, and a lot had happened by then. So th I suppose the first thing to say is that there's a prehistory to the home computer, which is a hobbyist, small groups of hobbyists used to build their own computers from kits. And then in the very early 1980s, uh, you get the development and of the, uh, and the promotion of the Sinclair computer, the, the early Sinclair computers, ZX80, ZX81, and then the uh, BBC computer. So all those things had happened before I started studying it. There, and there'd been a great, um, I suppose in my, the way I characterise this in my PhD is to talk about the home computer boom as a public event. Obviously there are all these individuals who decide that they're going to go out and buy computers, but from my perspective, they were participating in this wider public event. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of concern about information technology. There were things going on like the Computers in Schools program. The government were encouraging uh, what they termed uh, computer literacy in a variety of different ways. And I think 1982 was, IT, was deemed IT year, a whole year of promoting computers and computer literacy. Um, and I felt when I started to talk to a lot of the early users of home computers, the thing that interested me most was the way that they were responding to that excitement and participating in that wider event of the boom. Mm. We had a look at the uh, first Sinclair computer and, and you said that that was a very good example uh, because people normally had one computer in the house and what was so special about that particular Sinclair computer? Well, I think the... Um, the Sinclair computer is interesting for lots of reasons, but um, one thing that I do think is interesting about and is worth remarking on is that it was, it was, it was a British computer. That a lot of these computers, they were produced for a British market by British makers, uh, rather than, I suppose now we're used to these kind of ideas of these global computer corporations selling global, global products. It's a very sort of British story the development of the Sinclair computer and indeed the uh, BBC, the Acorn computer and the BBC B. Um, the other thing about the, 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 the Sinclair's extreme example of maybe something that's there with all these computers is that um, it's actually got very little functionality. I think it's got sort of, you know, it's got a tiny, tiny amount of capacity within the computer. Um, so why, why, what were people doing with these computers? I think they were experimenting with what a computer could do. Uh, you, you shouldn't underestimate the excitement that people had to the idea that they actually owned a computer. Not that long ago, for most people, computers were these great big machines, you know, in mysterious machines in, a, in an air-conditioned room somewhere. And the idea that they could actually have something called a computer in their home was something that was very exciting. But they're also actually 
quite unclear as to once they've got this computer exactly what, what should they be doing with it. Um, and one of the things I really like about your display here is the way that it's set up because you've got the, um, the, the computer which of course didn't have its own screen, you had to plug it into the family computer, and a uh, family television rather, and of course at this time it was actually quite unusual for families to have more than one television in their house. Um, it would be plugged into the family television and then what would you do with the computer? You would try and put code into it, uh, people would buy, you know, there would be manuals or their magazines or whatever, and people would try to put, put code in and get these computers to, to run. Often, uh, lots of frustrating evenings trying to get them, get them, get them to run. Um, so this, and um, a lot of the people I spoke to talk back to this time, you know, a period of where the computer kind of rather took over the life of the home, you know, the family home, you know, so that, um, you know, battles over the television and, and uh, you know, lots of arguments about people spending too much time on the computer and staying up too late and all their, you know, all memories of people swearing because they couldn't get the programs to go and all this kind of element to it. But, but um, another social scientist, Leslie Haddon, had this great phrase for describing these early computers. He called them self-referential computers. They didn't really have any much functionality to them. But their primary purpose was to be a computer. Ah. And the prime, what were people doing with these things? They were, they were exploring what a computer was. Then you also mentioned that Sinclair was yeah. very good at utilising the media. Yes. And that it was uh, also the media who created this whole hype. Yeah. Could you tell a little bit more about that? Well, Sinc yeah, so S Sinclair's also an interesting figure because of the way that he exploited a, a wider governmental and media interest in computing and what at that time was called the information technology revolution or the computer revolution or the micro revolution, all these different ideas. But the idea that somehow uh, um, the microcomputer was, was going to bring about a fundamental transformation in society and the economy, and it was up to everybody to respond to both the promise and the threat of this computer revolution. And um, Sinclair was very good at, at riding that wave, so he portrayed himself as an example of a new kind of British entrepreneur that was going to you know, rescue the British economy, but he was also good at... Um, saying to people um, in, in the, you know, these very sort of memorable uh, adverts that he placed in Sunday supplements and newspapers and so on and saying, look, here's your chance, here's a chance for you. And often it was your family to own a computer and be part of the computer revolution. In the time you had Sinclair, yeah. on the same display you had the Acorn yes. computer. And you mentioned that different types of people owned different computers. Yeah, I thought, yeah, that was one thing that was, yeah, so by the time I was actually talking, I did a lot of work with users, early users of the computers. So I, 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 that was partly going along to things like computer clubs, because there were lots of these, again, people forget this, people didn't just, you know, that, again, part of the excitement was that people would go along to clubs in order to, use computers and do this. These clubs might be in libraries or computer shops or all different kinds of places. But also I went along and I spoke to um, lots of different types of household who'd had these computers. Um, and one thing that was interesting was the way in which people came to identify different, uh, different computers with different sorts of um, activities, almost different kinds of moral values. And you could see a lot of people's hopes and anxieties for the computer played out in the way in which they talked about the different brands. Hmm. So um, a computer like the Commodore 64, which, was a, which wasn't a specifically British computer, which was one of the early computers to be marketed more uh, in a more kind of fun, games-orientated way, I think a lot of the parents were uh, quite concerned about this. You know, they didn't really like the idea of this sort of computer. And a lot of them were uh, much more comfortable with, say, the BBC computer, the Acorn and what became the BBC B, because this was very closely associated with the Computers in Schools initiative and was seen as a, um, you know, this is a sort of worthy educational machine and I mean it's quite a large financial investment at that time to buy one of 
these computers. Um, what, and, but lots of families would say, well, we got this rather than a Commodore or the Sinclairs or whatever, because this was a proper educational computer mm. that would really help their children. And the Acorn, what was it sort of like? You mentioned the push computer. Yeah, so I think I think there wasn't. <laughs> that, well, I don't. Without wanting to overplay it, I think that well, snobbery is the wrong word. But I think I do think that 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 it was the sort of there. There was a kind of the the, the respectable middle. The Acorn and the BBC were the kind of respectable middle class version of mm. of the home computer because of their associations with ed education, Excuse rather me. than the more kind of ambiguous use of the kind of Sinclairs, what were they for and what were people getting up to them. So when you started your research, yeah. um, what was your question? What was the main question you wanted to answer? Uh, well, I suppose when I started, I was interested in the boom itself, the public event of the boom that it did seem an event that, that people were participating in and trying to understand the excitement that people felt about these computers. And there was a, also, I think, to be honest, when I started, a kind of degree of cynicism. I'm sort of thinking, well, why? Why did people want these computers? What were they going to do with the computers? I, I also had a kind of curiosity, really, about what use people were going to put the computers to. Um, and I think the interesting thing was when I, the more I spoke to people about the computers, particularly the later adopters, the people that, not the, perhaps the early hobbyists, but later the kind of, what a better term, the kind of ordinary families who mm. bought the computers. Um, my curiosity as to what the computer was for was really matched by them. So I sort of felt like I'd be going on saying, well, what are you using the computer for? And then quite often my experience was they were almost saying, well, I don't know, what should we be using it for? Um, and I suppose my take on a lot of the people that I spoke to was that over time they did become clearer about what the computer was. But initially they, they had very little idea, especially there's, you know, about, they had, you know, a kind of, they were inspired, excited in a broad terms with the idea that you would have a computer in your home. But they, had, they didn't have a very clear or very well-defined idea as to what its purpose was, how they were going to use it, and, and, and so on. But I think by the time I'd finished doing my empirical work in about 1988, you could see already that things were settling down a lot. Um, and this is partly about what was going on in terms of the market, in terms of the products that are available. But I think it's also that I, my argument would be that the users themselves were helping to kind of clarify what the purpose of the computer was. Hmm. So towards the end of the time I was studying, so you could see that computers had a much clearer identity. You know, you've got the, the early Amstrads being taken up that were very clearly a word processing computer. You had the development of new generations of uh, what were in effect games consoles or glorified games consoles that are unequivocally about playing games. And to some extent, the idea of a general purpose home computer begins to disappear, as does the idea that the computer is for the whole family, which early on is a big inspirational idea, promoted by the government and also promoted by marketers like Sinclair, the idea that this is a computer for the home that all the family are going to use. And I think by the end of the 80s, that as well starts to go by the board so what was the home computer used for, sort of like mainly? Um, well, I think early on you have to remember that there's very little commercial software available. Um, so what people are doing largely is coding and then running programs that they've coded. Um, but, but particularly with the early machines, it's the coding itself that's the primary activity rather than the functionality produced by these, mm. by these programs. I mean, I think uh, some of the early users did um, enter code to write, you know, they would play computer games that they coded in themselves. They might, <coughs> they're not necessarily making up the programs from scratch. I mean, what they're normally doing is that they're, they get hold of code out of a computer magazine or out of a manual or, or whatever. Uh, they code it in and then they, they, they uh, play the game. 
But I think often it's the actual coding is the primary activity rather than the resultant Doing it. functionality. And at the time, mm. how many coding clubs were around or computer clubs um, in the country? I don't know the answer to that question. How many computer clubs were there? I don't know. I was, maybe someone else could tell you the answer to that. I would say that, um, well, for example, I, was, I focused on one particular area of outer London, and I was studying that mm. area. And in that area, there'd been um, a regular computer club at the local library, uh, there was a computer shop that sold home computer products and software and so on. That ran a, that ran a computer club as well. And also, a lot of the pe younger people that I spoke to, there would be, at after school or at lunchtime, there would be something called computer club at, in a secondary school. So I think there are all these different sorts of clubs going on at that time. And was it government driven or consumer driven? I think it's a mixture of both. I mean, but I think there was a real, there's a real push to get computers into schools. Uh, and there would be, um, you know, one or two teachers who would be the champions of computing. They would mm. go, you know, go on courses, go on training. And their job would be to champion the computer to their colleagues and to other members of staff. And I don't think they'd probably typically be the ones that would be running the, the um, computer club. But a lot of it is consumer driven. So um, I talked um, to a lot of uh, older teenagers who'd previously been in a computer club when they'd been younger. And it was really them who'd been driving it. Mm. You know, the club was held at, um, held at a computer shop, but it'd been, it'd been them that had been asking for this, okay. this club. They wanted a place where they could do, compute, do computing together there's this sort of interesting tension between the idea that computing is something that should take place within the family and say with these, these teenagers, what they wanted, you know, it's the beginning of something we're very familiar with now, the idea that this is something that teenagers share amongst themselves, you know. Mm. Um, and that, um, actually, they were nearly all boys that I spoke to. And again, I don't, that, that pattern has persisted to some extent now, I think. So if you look at your research now, what yeah. do you think the main sociological changes have been um, by the rise of the home computer? Yeah, well, I th looking back on, on my research, I mean, it's very tempting. I could, I could be very critical about my methods and my approach, and there, there are lots of things I would do differently and all these kind of things. Um, but I think there are some things that do... That, that remain interesting and stand, the, stand the, the, the test of time. And I think one of them is it is important to remember how things that we think of as being um, fixed and obvious about what is a computer, how it should be used, um, who should use it, all those things, they were, earlier on they were all up for grabs. Computers could have been different. Mm. And they're, they're really interesting questions as to how these types of computing emerged. It's a combination of, obviously, what's happening amongst the producers. But the early users play a really important part in a sort of discussion about, about what's the computer for, how it should... And, and um, uh, they help to develop the, the usability of the computer. Are you aware whether there were formal feedback forums for the early users to communicate with businesses or research centre, or how do you think they... Well, I mean, very early on, almost pre... The, 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 you know, pre-Sinclair, it's almost hard to distinguish between the producers and the hobbyists. Ah. So they're almost one and the same people. Uh, but yes, I think they. But I think they did have formally and informally lots of really good connections back to the to the users, and the fact that there are all these sort of public fora in which the producers and the users can meet either face to face or 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 by writ in written form, mm. things like computer magazines, uh, lots of um, computer, you know. Uh, 
conferences and exhibitions and so on where the producers are, are there with the users I think is really really important and of course a lot of the really early early consumers then go on to be producers so who I mean and, and you'll probably know this better than me but I mean I suspect that when you when you talk to a lot of the people who were involved in computing from the 90s onwards they start off as the you know on the Sinclairs and the BBC Bs when they're teenagers yes yeah you're now based in Cambridge yeah. and within your research you came across Cambridge names yes so who do you think in the Cambridge area had the most profound effect on home computing Cambridge and the Cambridge area does play an important part in the history of the British home computer boom. So both um, Sinclair and Acorn are based in this, in this area. Uh, I, I uh, teach at Anglia Ruskin University on a Cambridge campus and actually the, the building which is, is now part of our IT centre was the head office of uh, Sinclair Computing. I mean they had this sort of, what at the time was this very swish sort of very sort of space age offices that now look like a bit of a sort of 80s period piece and in fact featured in um, a newspaper ad at the time called where, where the headline was Silicon Alley because it's just at the end of a residential street um, so there was this sort of portrayal of oh this is this is the British response to Silicon Valley in California you know the end of this residential street in uh, in Cambridge you know here's the beginning of the British computer industry Okay. Um, where did your interest from computers come from? Because you said that you worked in computers for a bit. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Um, yeah, it was a family one. So it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. So I think, uh, like, uh, like people would go, well, you know, I'm, my grandfather was a miner, and my, you know, the same. I could do the same. So I have this family history that relates to computing. So that um, my dad's dad worked for National Cash Registers from the 1920s, uh, selling uh, accounting machines. And uh, it, during the, during the uh, recession of the late 20s and 30s, he got lots of his uh, brother's jobs also at National Cash Registers. So they all worked uh, at NCR selling, selling accounting machines. And then actually my, then my dad and his brothers then also worked for NCR in the 1950s. And they all then went on to work in the computer industry in different shapes or forms. Um, so my dad worked for uh, NCR and then he worked for a company called Freedom. Uh, and then he went and started his own company um, selling and marketing computers and then eventually word pro uh, electronic calculators and word processors. Um, my uncle worked for the National Computing Centre. <laughs> uh, my other uncle had a, a software company and so on. So, so I had this sort of family background in computing and partly, and so, and I did work sort of uh, briefly in the family business in that set of work for my dad, um, uh, mainly in sort of sales support uh, with a lot of the sort of early word processing machine, with early versions of word processors and doing things like, you know, word processing and database management and these kind of things. So. Um, in the era, just at the beginning of the PC era, okay. in the sort of 80, what, 81, 82, that kind of, that kind of period. If you now know yeah. more about sort of like the effects of home computing, yeah. what elements do you feel as a museum we need to capture about the uniqueness of this period? I think there are lots of really good things about the way the museum's done it, actually. So I'd really like the, the, the setup here with the, the, the recreation of a computer room in a school. Um, the only thing I'd say about this is this is a bit later on when there are a lot of computers, whereas early on you'd have one computer in the corner of a cl classroom. Because of course, the government rhetoric was, you know, a computer in every classroom, you know, like the five-year plan <laughs> kind of thing. Um, um, I, I think the only thing I would like to see more of is to make strange the fact that actually most of the time the early computers people didn't have a screen they didn't have a they didn't come with their own screen 
So I think it would be great to have some sort of display which was like a family, you know, the family television with a computer plugged into, into it. And the other thing which you do have a bit, but I think is really important, is, is the, all the kind of uh, associated uh, publishing activity around the home computer boom. Computer, you know, the multitude of computer magazines and computer books and so on. Um, and I think it would be also great to have um, these initiatives, the government initiatives, like the Computer in Schools initiative, IT year, and all these kind of th things represented as well. But I think the museum's great. I think it's, there's lots of fantastic things here. If you could ask, because you concentrated more on the, on the effect on society yes. and on the early users, but yeah. you didn't go into um, the makers, actually, yes. the, the, the yeah. founders. So, yeah. uh, but if you could ask people who created the machines yes. questions about sociological effect, of what effect it had, what questions would you ask them? What questions would I ask the, the makers? I don't know. I mean, I suppose, particularly with Sinclair, I would, I'd love to know why he was convinced that there would be a market for the very early computers, for the ZX80 and the ZX81, why he believed it. Because there is this leap of faith, the idea that you could build really to price so you could get down to the, so you could say, here, have a computer for less than 100 pounds. It doesn't really matter what it can do, but here it is. You know, why, why he believed that that would, would, would work. Um, the, uh, but the other thing that I would do, actually, if I go back, is, well, I don't know whether apologise is quite the right word, but I think in hindsight, I was very cynical about something, which to at least some extent did come true. So, I... What was going on during the 80s was that, obviously, there are the British economy and British society is in turmoil. There's uh, deindustrialization. There's lots of talk about Britain in decline and so on. And I think that's one of the reasons why all this sort of focus on home computing and the home computer boom was so intense. You know, this is the, this is our response. You know, this is going to get us out of all this trouble. You know, if only we can train everybody and get everyone familiar with these computers. And I think at the time, I was, in, I was very cynical about this. But it half came true, to be honest. I mean, it is true that just this sort of leap of faith that if you train up, you know, you expose hundreds of millions of people to coding and to computing, you are going to create a generation of people who are familiar with, happy with computers. Um, and I think they, those people did the next generation did contribute to a lot of successful things in the British computer industry in a way that I was, entire, I have to admit, entirely sceptical about. When I, as a, I spent a lot, a lot of time talking to um, different kinds of households that had home, home computers in them, and uh, one of the things that was really striking, particularly when you spoke to parents, was the way in which the computer, computers in general, and the home computer, excite, uh, you know, prom it promoted very sort of strong, prompted very strong feelings. So, sort of, you know, both hopes and fears. So in terms of computing in general, there's a belief in the promise of the IT revolution, but there's also an anxiety about well, what's gonna happen, you know, what, will there be any jobs for people, you know? Uh, and th so there's, there's, there's both a kind of excitement and an anxiety about computers in general. Will they take away all our jobs? But in relation to home computing, you can also see those, those hopes and fears are, are also very strong. You have to imagine me going around doing my, my research. So I, I talk to different kinds of computer users and I did go to computer clubs and do various things. But eventually, rightly or wrongly, I decided I needed to go and find the so-called real users of these home computers so I tr actually sort of tramped the streets of Rice Lip and Uxbridge putting and I put n notes through hundreds and hundreds of doors saying have you got a home computer will you talk to me and the idea behind that was that I would get to talk to a cross-section of different sorts of adopters of these home computers and there were lots of interesting things about about those interviews 
But quite often what I ended up doing was talking to parents about their hopes and fears for their children. Um, so when, when you spoke to them about uh, why did you buy the computer, uh, what use did you want to put the computer to, you could see those hopes and fears were really evident. So the hopes and fears were firstly about computing in general. So I often felt that when people were buying this computer they were responding to the sort of idea that computers were going to be important to everybody in the future and they needed to respond to the IT revolution. You know. But the part of this is a fear of being left behind, a, you know, a fear that computers are going to take your job and these kind of things. And then similarly, there are enormous sort of hopes and fears for what the computer is going to do for the family. So there's this idea that the, fam the computer is going to be something that the family together are going to participate in. The computer is going to be educational. The computer is going to prepare children for the future going to give them a head start but there are also anxieties that somehow this is going to go wrong and the computer is going to be used for the wrong reasons you know so a phrase that they would continue to do parents go well I don't want the computer to, to be just used for, com for playing games on you know there must be some other use that we can put put the computer to it's got to be it's got to be educational it's got to be practical but there is this sort of idea that um, the computer is important one way or the other you know, this can either go all right or go all wrong, but there's this idea that somehow you have to respond to this wider rhetoric about computers in the future by trying to get to grips with the micro. Is that why you call it a public event? Because it was driven by the government? What do you think the I uniqueness think it was a, of that thing? I think it was a public event. It was driven by a lot of things, but I think part of it was uh, the government, things very concrete things like IT year and computers in schools initiatives to do with computers in libraries but also the rhetoric of uh, government government ministers there was an IT <coughs> minister Kenneth Baker whose job seemed to be primarily because remember this conservative government who doesn't want to intervene in, directly in the economy so all their interventions in relation to IT a lot of them are kind of cultural ones there's this sort of belief that they just need to promote computing promote the right sort of attitude towards computing and things will somehow come right because of that. Um, but yeah, the, the event is also a kind of bottom-up event as well, you know, so uh, people are um, starting computer clubs, starting computer magazines, starting computer fanzines, you know, sort of their own Xerox newsletters and, and all kinds of different weird computer organisations. I mean, at one point I went along uh, and actually, with hindsight, I really wish I'd spent a lot of more time than I did with them. But I mean, I, I went along a few times to a club that was a sort of like really a sort of new age computer club, which at the time seemed to me completely wacky. They're all inspired by the idea that, well, with computing, we'll all be linked together and so on. And now you think, well, actually, they were talking about the internet. To me at the time, it just seemed like a lot of really balmy, sort of hippie, new age stuff about computers are going to connect us all together and so on. So all kinds of little sort of initiatives that are from the bottom as well as from the top, I think. And, and, and also the computer industry itself is trying to promote this and all the kind of spin-offs. It's the publishing, computer, the publishing, print publishing has a great boom around computers as well. Computer magazines, computer books, all these kind of things. What do you think would have happened if the internet had come out at the same time as the home computer? What would have, yeah, it's an interesting question to ask what would have happened if the internet had come out at the same time as the computer? Uh, I don't know what the answer to that is. What is interesting is the way in which early on there's not much interest in connectivity, that people are prepared to play around with the standalone computers, whereas there are other sorts of experiments going on other places, aren't there? Like the, um, is it the Minitel experiment in France, which is much more a kind of government attempt to it, connect people. Um, there are people who are kind of talking about playing around with connectivity, but it is it, a lot of the function, and it's interesting how a lot of the functionality isn't there because they aren't connected. So you would, you know, you would find people who'd spent 
days, you know, nights, night after night, trying to write, write a program to manage their home accounts. But of course, not much point unless you can really connect up to your bank or whatever to, to, to do this. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest, but it is interesting how people are playing, you know, it's the missing link to a lot of the things that people are doing. It's not really my idea, but I think there's a very interesting um, way of thinking about the development, not just of the, the technologies, but also the kind of philosophy behind uh, computing, which is that actually you can go way back to the sort of 30s and 40s, and people are really inspired by this idea, of sort of cybernetic ideas about a connected society we're all connected up together. And the idea that you could, uh, a lot of it is very top-down kind of command and control, but the idea that we could all be connected together. But then that, that idea has been around for ages. And then, then it's almost like maybe you needed the next phase, which was about let's get um, out the computer out of, a, out of its air-conditioned room and into everybody's workplace and into everybody's home. And that was happening in the 80s. And then it, the next phase, the internet phase, brings those two things together. And then that kind of takes everything up to a, a new level. But the interesting thing, in a way, if you look at take the long view, is with the internet, what it allows is the, the bringing together of those two things, that sort of 80s, enthusi 80s sort of bottom-up enthusiasm for the microcomputer and that earlier mid-20th century kind of cybernetic vision of a connected world. When you did your interviews, um, was there a gender issue? Yes, so when I did my interviews, there was a big gender issue around computing. One thing that was interesting was that my PhD supervisor, who's called Roger Silverstone, who was a real pioneer of... Um, what he called ethnography of media use within the home. And he was developing his ideas about, more wide, wider ideas about trying to understand how media use took place within the home alongside my project, which is about home computing. So he was, very he was very concerned that I should talk to families as a whole about the home computer. And I think, you know, inspired by this sort of idea that, that um, he wanted everybody's perspective within the household on it. But in practical terms, what I found was when I was trying to do my research, it was really hard to set up interviews with everybody in the household to talk to them about this. So you would, there would be one or two people that would respond to my appeal for help and say, oh, yes, I'm really interested in computer. Yeah, please come along and talk to me. And I would say, oh, I want to talk to everyone in the household. And then surprise, surprise, you'd arrive at the household and um, either you would, you would have everybody together and try to talk to them all, in which case you'd have this very stilted kind of conversation where actually um, quite often mum or the daughter would have comparatively little to say, or else more typically was you'd arrive at, arrive at home thinking that you were going to talk to everybody and then actually it would be the dad or the teenage son who'd go, oh, I did tell everybody, but they're not here, you know. Mm. Um, and so even at that basic level, in terms of talking to people, I actually had to work really hard, and I did towards the end of the project, uh, purposefully sample households where there were uh, younger women or, uh, you know, uh, either teenage women, teenage girls or, or um, older women who were the primary computer mm. users. But I had to look a lot harder for them. And the clubs? The clubs varied a lot in terms of uh, the kind of characters of the club. So the early hobbyist computer clubs did tend to be male orientated, came coming out of sort of hobbyist electronics. The more uh, the kind of worthy library based ones, yeah, they were male again, but perhaps more more women going along to them. But again, the sort of the say like the computer club that I went along to, it was teenage boys who dominated that that club, yeah. uh, and you know there wasn't really space for teenage girls to come along come along to the club. The social class dimension to this is is interesting, I think, because I think like everywhere else, 
the take, there were, the, the take up was skewed in terms of social class, but it was different to other countries. So um, I, didn't, I didn't do uh, sort of quantitative research on this, but there was some quite reasonable market research looking at the, not the very early adopters, but that sort of mid-1980s. And the thing that was different about Britain, I remember, in comparison to other countries was that, I mean, using that sort of marketing split, you know, the A, B, C1, C2, Ds and oh, Es, yeah. um, actually the take-up amongst the Cs was very strong. Which so the sort of, so obviously the A's and B's, so the professional and managerial kind of middle class occupations, the take up is high, but it's, it's nearly as high amongst uh, sort of routine white collar workers and um, skilled manual workers, more affluent sections of the working class that they were adopting in, they may not have been adopting the same computers, but they were buying computers in, in the same numbers as the middle classes which was very different from other countries. So the, 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 just if you think about it as a consumer electronic, Britain's different from um, uh, certainly other European countries in terms of the take-ups earlier, more computers are sold, but actually that class makeup is quite different. Because of government interference? Um, maybe, maybe also the price barrier. So that one of the things that, that Sinclair did was sell, was produce computers to a price, so it, that made the, the computers more affordable to people. Hmm. Um, I think that's, that's an element of it. Is it a disposable income thing rather than class thing? Because, as, as you said, yeah. a lot of blue collar workers are actually earning a lot of money there. Yeah, well, they're, or they're earning more, yes, yeah, so I think there is, that they're, they're, they're affordable. But I think for all the people that I talked about, I mean, at the risk of getting into that sort of like, well, you know, you could. Yeah, hundred pounds was a lot of money in them days. Kind of conversation, but I mean, you do have to remember that actually, they are still quite a significant financial investment. Mm. So I mean, I think something like this would be four hundred quid, four hundred pounds to buy a BBCB in the nineteen eighties. I don't quite know what the equivalent of that, but it's quite a considerable amount of money. Plus, well, are you going to buy another television? Televisions were a lot more expensive relatively in those days. So that it's not an insignificant amount of money to spend yeah. for, for a lot of the families that I spoke to. Next week, the uh, BBC Micro, almost sort of like second phase, is yeah. going to be launched. Yeah. So the, the BBC has got a campaign, Make It Digital. Right. Um, of course, with the first BBC sort of uh, micro project, uh, it, they utilised the media, but the whole media scene was different. You didn't have social media. People were watching TV yep. in their living room with their family. That was the centre point of yep. the living room. Now the BBC are relaunching the BBC micro project yep. to educate the next generation of coders and yes. digital makers. Sociologically, what is different, different setting? Well, it, it would be interesting to see what this sort of the second coming of the BBC micro project, what impact it will have, um, whether it will have anything like the impact that the first one had. I find it quite hard to believe that it will really. Um, but I do still think it's very interesting. I mean, one of the things I think is interesting is this return to coding and return to the idea that it's important for people to learn how to code and to, if you like, get, get within the black box of the computer to, in order to understand how it works, which is very much the spirit of the early phase of the home computer boom. But, of course, what happened towards the end of the 80s was this sort of move away from this, you know. Oh, well, now... We know what a computer is, and it's all about the functionality. Doesn't matter. You don't have to learn how to code. Here's a word processor. You don't have to know how to code. Here's a here's a floppy disk with the computer game already written on it. Um, and it's it's interesting this re revival of in, revival revival of coding, and a return to the idea that people should, you know, if you like, get under the bonnet of a computer and really understand how it, how it works. And I find that very intriguing. Um, and that will, it will, I'd be very interested to see how that plays out. Um, but part, and I, th I think the other thing that I think is interesting, which is, you know, the, com the computer museum's part of this, 
is the way in which you've got people who are now very well established and successful as part of the British computer industry who uh, have this sort of nostalgia for that earlier phase and this belief, you know, this probably quite well-founded belief that this was a really important thing which happened. And so their, their own commitment to that, again, I find really intriguing, you know, the idea that, well, we should, we should put something back by teaching, teaching people to, to, uh, to code. But maybe there are other things that we can't, can't anticipate that might come up other sorts of, other sorts of in interest. I think the other thing that's interesting is what's to put this alongside what's happened to the internet, where for, for a while, again, you know, the internet was up for grabs, wasn't it? Mm. There all these, it felt like something very exciting. It wasn't clear what you were going to use it for and all this kind of stuff. And then it's kind of almost gone through the same process, isn't it? It's become, you know, it, oh, it's all about the functionality. You don't have favourites anymore because you don't have your own fav you know you don't write your own blog anymore you don't have your, your you don't even have your own favorites you just have your own few platforms that you revisit every half an hour on your smartphone mm. you know and um i almost wonder whether what would be almost as interesting would be whether there'll be a similar kind of revolt in relation to the internet that people will want to get un back underneath the bonnet of the internet as well the last thing I would like yeah. is sort of like to introduce this uh, Leslie Haddon because in yeah. 1999 you wrote an article with uh, Leslie Haddon, The Enigma of the Micro Social Science Computer Review. So who is this person? Why did you choose to write an article together? Okay, I wrote an article in, in uh, I think actually it was in 1991. With, uh, Les with Leslie Haddon about the uh, British micro boom called the Enigma of the Micro. Uh, and it was, uh, Leslie and I had done our PhDs in parallel, really. Uh, he was a lot more efficient about doing his than I was, I have to say, but we did it in parallel. Um, he was interested in the British home computer boom. He started off by looking at, from the perspective of the producers, where, whereas mine was very much focused on the early users of the home computer. But we'd had, over the years, we'd had lots of discussions, and Leslie was immensely helpful to me during my PhD. And so the article was really us saying, look, we've had all these discussions. What can we learn by putting the two accounts together, the, the, producer, the account of the producers and the account of the users? And our argument in that paper was that you could see these weren't two parallel stories, they were two related stories that you got through from the late 70s through to the end of the 80s, uh, a kind of firming up of what computing, what home computing might be, or what microcomputing might be for a non-business user. And that process had been a kind of a dialogue amongst and between the producers and the users. And between them, they kind of come up with this these set of uses and, a, and an answer to the question, well, what's a home computer for? 